Welcome back to another episode of Life Below the Surface. I'm your host, Josh, and today I'm joined by two doctors. Don't worry, I'm feeling okay. I'm being joined today by Dr. Katie Lyons, one of our research scientists, and Dr. Dane Budo, who is a marine biologist and the director of external engagement. Dr. Dane, Dr. Katie, doctor, doctor, welcome to the podcast. Now, you both play a huge role in our conservation and research initiatives here at the aquarium. So, and Katie, I'm gonna start with you. Can you tell me just a little bit about what you do? Sure, um, so I, like as you said, I'm a research scientist here. Basically, that means that my job is to help um, increase our scientific presence in the scientific community. So my specialty is on shark and ray biology. So pretty much all of my projects that I work on have to do with their reproduction, um, their ecology, or their physiology in one way or another. Very cool. Dane, same question. What do you do here? Great, you know, um, so I'm in charge of external engagement. What is external engagement for mission-based programs? So research, conservation, education, from communities just next door to the aquarium to communities thousands of miles away uh, relating to climate change, ocean conservation, marine protected areas. What do communities need and how can we help? That's where, that's where I come in. Very cool. So that's kind of a, a great kind of lead in because it's, it's no secret to us especially, but also to our listeners that many, many species on the planet today are in danger of becoming extinct. Dr. Katie, can you tell us just a little bit, like kind of give us some, some insight into this, like what is causing, especially in the, in the marine environment, what is causing so many species to become threatened or endangered? Uh, humans. <laughs> Uh, so we have um, an unfortunate large footprint that we leave on the environment and we leave that in many different ways. Uh, so fishing is one of the number one causes for a lot of marine animals, particularly the ones that a lot of people tend to care about. So think about your sharks, like your large marine megafauna um, and, and animals of that sort. Um, so fishing definitely is a really big pressure, uh, but it is also one of the main protein sources that a lot of people rely on in other countries. So it's something like 70% of the world relies on some sort of marine protein to feed their families. Um, so it com you know, we have this um, need to want to be able to have people be able to feed their families, but we also need to be able to do that sustainably so we can have food for future generations as well as intact environments for people to be able to show um, the, all the variety of species that we have in the world. So really it comes down to the way that humans use resources and right now we're not doing a very good job of being stewards of this planet. And that's a, that's a pretty solid answer there, Katie. So Dane, I'm gonna actually ask you this one. It's just a little bit different. If, if everything that Katie just mentioned, if that, if that, trend, if that trend continues, especially for communities and, and populations around the world, if that trend continues, what will, what will our world, what will our ocean look like if we keep doing these unsustainable type of actions? Well, you know, it, it, it will lead to a situation where you have the ecosystem services that all of these species provide, the ones that we like to see, big ones, but also the tiny ones, these ecosystem services will affect human beings and communities and welfare and all of those features. Um, that will no longer be the case. So our food security, our mere existence, especially in small island developing states that are bombarded by hurricanes and storms because of loss of reef activity, climate change, all of this will change. So our very lifestyle will change because we depend on these species. So oftentimes we speak about saving the oceans. We're really saving ourselves by research and conservation of the oceans. I think that's a very important kind of point is that when people think of conservation or when there's an argument that conservation isn't important because, oh, it's not really affecting me, that's, and Dane, you might be able to speak on this a little bit more, that's, uh, that's not really true. Conservation affects all of us. And as you just said, it's, conservation is in a way almost a little bit more of a selfish kind of thing because yes, we are saving that particular species, but it ends up in the end benefiting us. Is that something that you 
um, something that you have like been challenged by in your career so far, trying to get people to understand that? No, definitely. I mean, we're all connected by the ocean in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't matter how far you are from that ocean, we are connected. By the very air we breathe, half of it comes from the ocean. You know, so we are connected. By the very food we eat, by the economy, we're all connected there. Uh, you mentioned the word selfish, and I'm happy that you mentioned that word, because if we were truly selfish, if human beings were truly selfish, we would protect the environment a lot more than we are right now, because we're protecting our needs, our need for food, our need for wonderful beaches around us to, to lay on a, on a vacation. If we are truly selfish, we will protect the environment a lot more than we are right now. So, okay, Dr. Katie, with, with, with that being said right there, what is, what is something that, say, the average person, or let's say you're, you're having a conversation with someone brand new, and you say, well, I'm a research scientist, and, you, you know, and we're gonna get into it later. You get to go out into the field and, and have some pretty cool experiences. W what is a way that, say, the, the, the average person that you bump into at a you know, restaurant or out and about or something like that, well, what, is, what is something that, say, you would give as advice to the average person to tr try to kind of help get these messages, especially the ones that, that Dane just mentioned. How do you kind of get those messages across? Yeah, I think the first thing I would say is go vote. I mean, a lot of the really critical things that we need to happen come at levels that are way above what most people have access to. And that's not to say that you shouldn't do the little things, right? Getting rid of plastic straws is a thing that makes us feel good, but it ultimately isn't gonna be the thing that stops climate change, which I think is the existential threat um, of not just our time, but probably all of humanity that we're gonna have to deal with. So I would say the first thing is to, to vote for people who are enacting policies that are, are gonna help us be sustainable on this planet. The second thing um, that I would say is to know where your food comes from and think about the types of resources that you use and what are ways that you can cut back on that. Is that taking public transit maybe a few more times than you might want to? Um, is that buying locally? Uh, as well as making sure that the seafood that you use um, is sustainably sourced. So a lot of the seafood we eat in the United States, we actually import it from other countries but we have one of the best well-managed fisheries here in the U.S. So we really should be supporting our commercial fishermen um, because, again, we, we go through those regulations. We're making sure that things are done properly. When you import it, you have no idea where it came from, how it was obtained, and um, there's just a lot of implications that come around with that. Very good answer. Dane, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add, add one more level to that. Um, go for it. You know, I work a lot with marine protected areas, and some of these marine protected areas are actually no-take zones. And when you go into a community and to say, you know what, we're gonna try and get these fisheries, fish stocks to rebound, but it would mean some sacrifice from the community. You cannot fish in this area at all. And I'm not talking about commercial fisheries, I'm talking about artisanal fisheries, small scale, just someone going out, capturing fish, catching fish for two hours, and setting that fish, and doing it again the next day because they've spent that money on food, they spend that money on, you know, for, for kids to go to school that day. The next day they have to do the exact same thing again. So trying to convince fishers to give up an area to get that long-term gain is it, one of the tough ones, but it, it has been done and it can be done because they're seeing the benefits of that. They're seeing where their impact or their, you know, impact has created a problem with fisheries but here, let's, let's, let's turn the tide now. It's an all hands on deck kind of approach, but you have to support them. Figure out what, what else can they do while they can't fish in this area for 20 years. Help them to get to that point, you know? So I think that it's, it's a working relationship. It's not just what they can do alone, but what we can do together. And it's very difficult for us to stay as scientists. This is what needs to be done, just do it. You have to bear in mind that this will cause a fallout from person's livelihoods and be cognizant of that. So, all right guys, I'm gonna be very, very honest with you. I'm gonna ground this here for just a second. I've talked to a lot of people from the aquarium, a lot of very passionate people. Hearing you two already in the very beginning of this has got me jazzed up. And it's not just the orange mocha frappuccino I just had that's really causing me to, it's you guys, your, your, your passion is infectious. 
and you're two of my favorite people in the entire building. And it's, it's, it's interesting, and I'm glad you guys are here because a lot of folks that are listening, they don't understand, like when they think Georgia Aquarium, they think of this massive underwater palace in the middle of downtown Atlanta. They don't realize that we actually have people that, yeah, that are, that are stationed here in the building, but their jobs are actually well outside the building. Georgia Aquarium's footprint is not just here in downtown Atlanta in Pemberton Place. We are actually going out into the field. We're trying to make impacts across the world, which is really cool. And a lot of people don't know that. So I'm really glad you guys are here to kind of tell you, uh, to, to honestly, to tell your story. So Dane, let's, let's kind of take it back a bit for you. What, uh, what kind of got you into this? Like, well, what got you into caring about the ocean? And, and, and honestly, from what you've said so far, it's a mixture of caring about the ocean and caring about people. And more people, I think, need to kind of meet in that middle and understand how connected they are. But how did you get started? Well, you know, um, this goes back to my childhood. Uh, I grew up in a tiny rural village in, in Jamaica, um, 20, 30 people. Very poor, you know, no running water, it's, it's that kind of thing. We have to find our food ourselves or grow it ourselves. Um, I've always wanted to be a marine biologist, and I couldn't swim. And most of my family, all of my family couldn't swim at that time either. I'm the only one in my parents' family that can swim. But I've always wanted to be a marine biologist, to be fascinated by the ocean, watching black and white shows. And I kind of dated myself here. There were no color televisions when I was growing up as a child, all right? Available at that time um, to us. But I was still fascinated by it. I was in total awe about it. But having that background of you know, the small scale, locally led initiatives, and realizing that when I want fish to eat for a Sunday dinner, I have to go to the fishermen who's coming in on that morning and buy a fish from them. And you slowly see that going down. The stocks are going down, it's affecting the price of this fish, and we can't afford it. So it affected my dinner table in much of the same way. And that's what's kind of driven me to do something about it. Let's stop complaining about it. Let's stop documenting decline. Let's flip that. Let's change it. And I, I, I want to be an agent of change. And I think that I have been in some respects, and I want to continue to do that. But what, what I've realized is not just parachuting in and thinking that you know what's best for a community or a country. Ask them, what would work for you? How can we help? And taking that approach and helping people for their own livelihoods, that's what, that's, that excites me. That's what I want to do. I want to make a change. I want to be impactful in that way because in the long run, it would benefit us, benefit us all. So you're, you're basically, you're living proof of this type of mentality working, coming from where you've come from and seeing those changes and things. And, and you've dedicated your career now to improving what you saw as a decline, not just you know, for you and your family, but also you know, for, your, for your countrymen and now for you know, people around the world basically. Of, of, of course. And I mean, you know, I've set up protected areas and fishermen at the start of this have been brutal to me. How can you take away my livelihood? You're telling me I can't go to work for the next 10 years in this area. And for that to be flipped because they're seeing the benefits of that and they're coming to me, thank you for helping. And, you know, and that's fine. I, I love that kind of gratitude, but that's not why I'm doing it. The fish will never tell me thanks. Okay, if you're expecting that, you're in the wrong field. If a marine scientist is expecting a pat on the back from the things that we're protecting, do not get into this field. You know, so you have to have that deep-seated passion for it. Get up at five o'clock in the morning and head out to sea and out there for 12, 13, 14 hours. That's what drives you. And if you're feeling that you're not having that impact, do something else, you know, because that, that's what counts. You need passion to drive this impact. Amazing. All right, Katie, it's going to be tough to top that one there. That's a pretty awesome answer. But what's, what's your background? I know you're from the Southern California area originally, correct? The Southern California, yes. The yeah. Southern yeah. California, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm from the L.A. area. Go Dodgers. Um, so growing up, I also wanted to be a marine biologist since I was very tiny. Um, my parents, you know, were a middle-class family. My mom worked two jobs, and so on Monday nights, that was dad's night and he would take us to the beach, which wasn't 
terribly far away. Um, we'd go fishing, play in the sand, look for sand crabs. And my parents were very instrumental in allowing um, me to pursue my passion. So my sister and I had the very quintessential bedroom that we shared growing up. So on one side was all horses, on the other side was all dolphins. Um, and so my parents would enroll us in you know, after school programs that had to do with marine biology of some sort with our actual local aquaria. So I kept that passion all through high school and when I was going to college, you know, I pursued places where I could do a degree in marine biology, which in retrospect, you don't actually have to have a degree proper in marine biology. But um, that led me to UC Santa Cruz, which is where I did my bachelor's. And then, you know, when I was getting ready to finish up my degree, I, you know, knew I wanted to go to graduate school. I wanted to further my understanding. Um, I'm fascinated by how animals work and how their adaptations allow them to use the environments that they inhabit. So I pursued a master's degree and then eventually a degree, um, my PhD degree that was looking at environmental contaminants, so things that we've produced um, and have stuck around for decades because we literally manufactured those chemicals to do so and asked, well, what is the impact that this has on a lazenbrink species? And I was using the round stingray um, as a model species to see what, you know, what can we see in this meso predator that might be extrapolated up to some of the largest animals that we know bioaccumulate high levels of these man-made contaminants. So that's kind of my path of how I pursued, um, was really the questions of how animals work. Very cool. So it, in a way as well, kind of similar to, to Dane's story there, it's kind of like that, that environment that you got to experience and stuff, it, 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 being so close to the ocean, it's, a, it's really, really cool and actually very inspiring to hear you both talk about it. It's, uh, that's pretty awesome. But it, Katie, in, in your time, uh, kind of you know, growing up in the Los Angeles area, going to the beach and, and, and seeing the ocean, what kind of changes, when you go back to visit, what kind of changes have you noticed in your quote unquote home environment? Um, you know, is it, has it gotten better? Has it gotten worse? Um, you know, kind of describe that a little bit. Sure. I mean, I wasn't uh, alive to remember um, the smog problem that Los Angeles had. That's a very famous thing, right? And this comes with regulation, right? We had to regulate the emissions coming out of our cars. Like it is physically unhealthy for people to breathe um, those sorts of combusted materials. So that, you know, the air had definitely gotten better, so that would be more of my parents' generation that would recall some of that. But in just thinking about when I go home to visit, it's hotter and there's more fires, right? Like California essentially is on fire almost year round and the fires only keep getting more and more destructive. So, um, and with regards to heat, like we grew up without air conditioning. Like my parents literally don't have AC when it's three digit temperatures in Fahrenheit, obviously. Um, so, you know, there are changes that we, you know, that you can see with your very own eyes. Like climate change is, is happening and we're not really working at a pace to avoid some of probably the most destructive things that will eventually befall us. And I think getting back to some of your points earlier um, and what Dane was saying, you know, we wanna be selfish, but we're also very short-sighted. So we need to be selfish and look further into the future. So looking further into the future with you guys both being here at Georgia Aquarium now, um, and uh, Katie, so what, what is your what is your day to day like? You know, looking because in, in in our careers and our jobs and our lives, yeah, we we can look at what is every single day, but then we also have to look at the the big picture. And I would assume, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I would assume that in a research scientist's day to day it's a little bit of, okay, what's ahead of me? And then what is ultimately had like a big picture kind of thing. So kind of describe what a aquarium um, research scientist, kind of describe what your, what your day to day and then, you know, kind of go forward, kind of let us know like day in the life and then a month in the life. And then how does that all kind of come together? Sure. So um, I would say that no two days are the same, which is 
nice. Like I like that, um, I don't wanna say unpredictability, but it keeps you on your toes, it keeps things interesting. Uh, people who are listening to this won't see me doing my clackety clack, but I spend a lot of time on the computer. <laughs> so Well, they're gonna hear it, so yeah. it's perfect, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I spend a lot of time on the computer, whether that is meetings, planning um, collaborative work with colleagues, whether that's writing manuscripts, because that is the currency of how our field operates. So it is very much a publisher parish. So if you're not able to write and communicate your science and get that out there, then what is the point? So, um, so those are kind of some aspects of my job. Um, we have a variety of interns, um, a couple of volunteers that come in um, here and now, and as well as graduate students that I advise. So kind of you have all those aspects and then um, there's a, a whole field program component that I run as well. So when you kind of zoom out to the month look, um, I probably travel 50% of every month. So it's quite a lot of on the go, which like I said, can be exciting. Um, I've gotten to go to some really cool places as part of my job, which I would not honestly be able to afford <laughs> as a regular citizen, but um, it can be tiring traveling all the time as well, so. Gotcha, very cool. Well, Dane, kind of the same question, external engagement. What does that, what does that day-to-day, month-to-month kind of year kind of look like, um, you know, for you? Kind of, kind of take us through, you know, kind of, uh, you know, kind of what you do. Well, I mean, as a, as a you know, marine biologist as well, um, we're looking for opportunities to make an impact. So a lot of it is relationship building. It's reaching out to persons, whether it's existing relationships or new relationships, organizations, local communities, persons, single persons, that can help us to work together in the ocean conservation field um, in pretty much any corner of the world. Um, there's no shortage of need for what we can do. So we have to be mindful of choosing you know, the right ones, the, the ones that will have our best interest at heart, be able to benefit from what we can bring. Uh, because if we allow ourselves to choose every single thing, we just be diluted and not make that kind of impact we want to create. So a lot of my day today is building those relationships, going out into the field, meeting these persons, helping them to develop projects, whether it's marine protected areas, I mean, we're, we're launching two new fish sanctuaries that we have to develop in Jamaica, my homeland, which is very, you know, very near and dear to my heart. So that's, that's a, special, a special two places. But every year we want to be developing more of these conservation areas. You know, the entire world is looking to protect 30% by 2030, but we want to protect more than that. Because it will take a lot more than 30% to reverse the decline that we've seen over the last five decades. Um, so it's working with those partners that can help us um, and help, we can help them as well. That's kind of my day to day. So I do spend quite a bit of time in the office, but also quite a bit of time at conferences and in the field working with native communities. I'm looking forward to you know, visiting Alaska in a few weeks time to develop these kind of projects where we can help to alleviate some of the climate change aspects, some of the fisheries aspects that, that's impacting cultures, that's impacting behaviors that impact in food security. You know, how can we help? So these are some of the things that I will do on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's keeping a finger on the pulse. That's extremely important. You want to maintain that relevance in the world around you so that we can know where we can intervene and help. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty awesome segue when you talk about impact and relevance, because just recently um, we had a visit from someone uh, very special to all of us, probably for, for different reasons, um, but she's very, very well known in the, in the marine conservation world. Uh, we recently at the aquarium had a visit from Dr. Sylvia Earle, which I know uh, Dane meant a lot to you. Um, can you just kind of tell us what that, what that visit was like and you know, kind of your feelings about, uh, about Dr. Sylvia there? Well, you know, um, so I've been working with Dr. Earle for a while, um, developed some hope spots around. Um, so I was happy that we could Mesh Georgia Aquarium when I came on board with Mission Blue, uh, Silver, Earl, Silver Earl's Alliance, um, to really enhance that. I, I was very happy that we could provide some time, some interface with the young scientists here at Georgia Aquarium, uh, the persons who are enthralled by what she's doing and totally motivated to have some face time. Because that motivation of just saying, hey, 
let's do it. Let's do it together and really rev them up. I think that was very, 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 very good for me, a very good experience for me to see that kind of interface. Uh, you know, we're happy that we're working with her a lot closer now to developing Hope Spots. Uh, we're going to be doing one in St. Helena's um, to make sure that that's a Hope Spot. And then, of course, looking to, for Alaska and some other places as well for Hope Spots. Spe these special places in the world that give us hope, but it also brings attention to ocean conservation issues. Um, and get, again, getting everybody together. We're right. all connected. That's a very good point. And for the listeners that have, that have been with us from the beginning, um, or if you're just kind of joining us uh, here, definitely go back to episode one, where I talked to, to Dr. Dove about the importance and the, the relevance and in the incredible environment that is St. Helena. So it's a very cool um, opportunity. And, and once you guys kind of hear those stories, you'll understand why that hope spot is so important. Very, 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 very much so. I mean, we've been working there for a while now. So to bring this full circle a bit and really get St. Helena's designated as a hope spot, and then, you know, it takes off from there. Mm -hmm. Bringing attention to, I mean, when persons hear about St. Helena's, they immediately Google it. Where is St. Helena's? You know, it's in the middle of the Atlantic, and not many people know anything about it. So it's a good way to kind of bring attention to that place and help St. Helena's, you know, marine conservation um, activities as well. Absolutely, and it's very important. So Dr. Katie, with, same with you, did, did you get a chance to meet Dr. Sylvia Earle? And it, it was, is she one of those, um, you know, was she an inspiration to you? Um, I actually was in the field fishing for sand tiger sharks, so I was unable to make her visit, unfortunately. Is, is her work something that, you know, kind of, is that something that kind of was a motivator to you in your career, among others, and if there's others, please. I mean, she's been inspiring. She was not necessarily my female um, role model that would be taken by Dr. Eugenie Clark, um, a very famous uh, female Elasmobrank research scientist. So, but that's not, again, to say that what she has done hasn't been impactful and very important for you know, inspiring people to want to do more and to think more about our connection to the ocean. Very cool. And as she just mentioned too, guys, I know we, we talked about it in a past episode as well. Um, Dr. Eugenie Clark, basically, she starts the storyline in our Sharks, Predators of the Deep gallery of that fear to fascination. She was one of the first people to really kind of dig in to, to kind of start myth busting before myth busting was was cool. Um, so it was, it was really cool to learn more about her as we develop the, the content and the storyline there for our, for our own Sharks Gallery. So guys, this has been awesome so far and you're, you're both extremely passionate people um, who, who are doing separate things, but as we've mentioned several times, it is all connected. And let's say we have a listener out there, and Katie, I'm gonna start with you. What, what is your, and in the, the realm of inspirations, things like that, what is your best advice to someone that wants to be the next Dr. Katie Lyons and get a chance to um, you know, become a research scientist and, and, and make an impact and be able to publish papers that, that can advance our scientific knowledge and, and conservation legislation? Vote. <laughs> I keep saying it, but it's really important, especially right now. Um, but besides that, I mean, if you're you know, really passionate about science and that's you know what you want to get into my advice to folks is try everything so depending on where you are in your career it's important just to get your feet wet um, so i think a lot of us know what we like but understanding what we don't like and what you know admitting to ourselves what we are not good at and what doesn't make us happy is really important because this field uh, can be very grueling and you know, passion is, is, is important, but you also want to make sure you are happy in doing what it is that you're doing. And it's not, you know, necessarily easy um, to get into. So I always encourage, you know, my students to say like, okay, how is this degree or what you're doing going to help you achieve your end goal? And if it's not, then, you know, don't waste your time doing that. Don't waste other people's time doing that. So, you know, but you don't know that until you, you try the various things. So I always encourage people to, you know, try it all. You know, you might be a lab person. You might be a field person. You might be a little bit of both, which is kind of where I fit in, is I like a nice balance of being both in the lab but also in the field. 
So you know, you don't get that until you go out and, and try. Right on. Dane, same question to you. What's your, what's your best advice? Get wet. That, that, that's my best advice. Um, you know, I didn't learn to swim until I was 20 years old. You know, swim class is not, wasn't a thing in, in Jamaica. And it was very low on the list, not even on the list of priorities for, to spend money on. Uh, but I wanted to be a marine biologist. So as, I don't want to, you know, people might say, I, I want people to follow my footsteps. I do not. I want people to erase my footsteps, to make bigger steps. And I want to help them to erase my own footsteps. Uh, you know, we're launching programs to, to teach kids how to snorkel, put a mask on, get into the water, getting them to dive. And that's one of the reasons I became an instructor, to teach people to dive, to teach kids from as young as 10 years old, to really harness that passion that we keep speaking about in marine sciences and giving them the tools and the advantage to be better than we were, uh, we are. Because that's the only way we can advance as a society. Your children have to be better than you because they're benefiting from everything that we've learned. And they're gonna be learning and avoiding some of those mistakes that we made, and they have to be better than you. So my advice is get in the water. You know, that's where the connection is. You don't have to necessarily be a marine biologist to make an impact. There's so many citizen science programs that you can do something on a Saturday morning to make an impact. But the connection is with the water. Yes, you can be on a boat, and that's your connection as well. You can be in the lab doing marine science, and that's fine as well, that's great, because we want that everybody working in, in the field to really advance this. So, you know, sign me up anywhere. I'll give all of my time if I could possibly do it, just to get more people in the water as much as possible. Nice. Well, Dan, I can tell you right now, after that, I think I want to go diving with you. So let's, let's plan a trip, bud. Anytime. All right, man. Sweet. So speaking of, of, of all of that, of, of getting in the water and, and that, I think my last question for you both, and Dana, I'm going to start with you, of your career so far, what's just something that, that sticks out in your mind? What's your favorite experience or favorite memory or the thing that you just kind of look back on of like, this is why I do it? Okay, um, I, I can think of a bunch of them, but I, I'll give you one. Um, I remember a, a fisherman who was extremely vocal against us and, and me um, setting up a fish sanctuary in, in, in his community because it took away his space, his favorite fishing ground. And two years after that, he came and shook my hand and said, thank you. I'm catching more fish outside of these sanctuaries than I've ever had, than my parents ever had. Um, that opportunity to do, and that, that was fulfilling for me. You know, on, on a more personal note, um, I still remember my first breath underwater 8,000 dives ago. And that, to me, is, is exhilarating. It was exhilarating, and I still think about that. And I live through the eyes of my diving students when I see their eyes light up when they breathe underwater for the first time. And that, I think, is one of those experiences that I will never forget, you know, that kind of connection with the ocean. That's very cool. And as, it, um, as a diver myself, I, it's, as soon as you said that, I have automatically, like, my brain just went back. I remember my first dive, too. I remember that first time hearing that Darth Vader, <sighs> so you're like, oh, that's kind of cool, you know, kind of thing. It, it, it doesn't get old. Um, yeah, that's, that's amazing. And all right, Dr. Katie, same question for you. What is, what is your one or maybe multiple kind of experiences that just kind of keep you going, that kind of stick out? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I think one memory that comes to mind was some field work that we were doing last year. So we have a project that is a student of mine. She just recently defended her master. So very, very proud mama bird over here for her. But her project wanted to answer the question, you know, can we use sharks as canaries in the coal mine to understand the health of Georgia's estuaries? So just for context, Georgia, while we have a very small coastline, we actually have the largest number of intact salt marshes along the eastern seaboard. So that might not sound very impactful, but considering the importance of these habitats, not just for nursery grounds for animals, but also for economies that we run on. So oyster fishing, um, shrimping, all of these sorts of different things. So we wanted to know, you know, can we see a relationship between what we 
were hypothesizing of human impact um, reflected in the sharks that we were out fishing for. So we are on the boat, we're doing um, what's called long lining, so it's exactly as it sounds. You put out a long line with a bunch of hooks on it. And you know we're, we're starting to pick up the line and you can just see this like storm that's like rolling in. And we can't leave, right? Like we have to pick up all the gear. Um, we also don't want to get struck by lightning, so it's like, okay, like we need to, you know, we really need to like get this going. And of course, it's one of those sets where there's, there's, it's like shark, 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 shark. And you're like, oh, oh my God, we have so many animals to process. And the whole team on the boat, though, just turned into this one hive mind. Like we all clicked. Like somebody could hand something to somebody else because they knew that's exactly what they needed at that particular moment. And we, um, yeah, it's kind of hard to, to describe um, anybody that's like played team sports where you just feel like, you know, I can make every basket that I put up um, to the hoop. It was kind of one of those, those feelings. And um, so we got, you know, all the animals safely back. We didn't get struck by lightning, but we were completely drenched. We were working in, um, you know, the all the thunder and rain coming, beating down on us. But afterwards, it was just one of the most exhilarating things of just having a group of people like click together um, so well. So that's definitely a memory that will stick in my mind for some time. Very, very cool. All right, guys, as we wrap up, last question here. So as you're walking around Georgia Aquarium, Katie, what's your favorite spot? Where, where, where are people gonna find you if you're just walking through the building? What's, what's like your spot? Uh, good question. I mean, this is a pretty good spot. <laughs> I like this spot a lot. Yeah, looking into Ocean Voyager and, and all that is, it's, it's impressive. It never gets old. And it's quiet. Very quiet. Well, it's quiet in here because we're doing this, but... Uh, it's normally quiet here. <laughs> yeah, it is nice and peaceful. Dane, how about you? I just, I just absolutely adore the shark gallery. Um, I mean, at at 7.30 a.m., when it's totally quiet, there's no one there, and I just sit there just for a little bit. Uh, it, it grounds me, it gets me excited as well, but it really centers me, uh, reminds me sometimes why we do what we do. To protect these species often misunderstood, because sometimes I, I'm misunderstood as well, so I can relate, but it's this misunderstanding and changing that. And you know, it reminds me also of the, not just the power that we have at Georgia Aquarium, but the responsibility of changing behavior, of changing attitudes, of fear to fascination of these creatures. Um, that's what gets me going, especially in the morning. Awesome. Guys, thank you so much. That was amazing. And thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you next time. <laughs>